Well, good morning. Let us gather one another together for this service with the words on screen. Creator God, you have made an to cultivate it reverently and responsibly. Forgive us when we forget our connection with all of creation. Creator God, you have made a world of abundance and intend for us to share so that all may have their daily bread. Forgive us when we lose the sense of hospitality and community. Creator God, you have sent us Jesus, the bread of life, to satisfy our spiritual hunger and thirst. Forgive us when we do not respond to his justice and mercy. Every day and all day, let us celebrate your goodness. Every day and all day, let us shape our very lives by focusing our minds on what is beautiful and worthy of praise. Amen. We remain standing to sing our first hymn, the real harvest traditional song, We Plough the Fields and Scatter the Good Seed on the Land.
Let us continue in prayer. Loving God, we gather today with a focus on your provision. In a city where farming and the tending of crops feels remote, where instead we're reliant on a supply chain and our experience of growing is limited to a garden or possibly an allotment. Instead, we have to give thanks for the labours of others across the globe who tend crops, rear livestock for our benefit, often through an inequitable supply chain. We thank you for works of organisations like Fair Trade, who work to ensure that farmers receive a living and sustainable recompense for their labour. May we look to support those efforts and choose our products appropriately. We thank you for a world that does provide Though our actions and the resulting changes to climate may be making that harder to achieve. Heavier rainfalls leading to waterlogged fields that the farmers can't actually plant their crops in, or flooded fields where seeds don't survive. Help us to see the changes needed at personal, societal and global levels to make our way of life more sustainable. We gather from a world of conflict and at this time of harvest we particularly think of those driven from their farms by war and conflict the Palestinians who can't harvest their olives because their orchards are beyond their reach. The people either side of the Israel-Lebanon border who fled for safety. Lord, we long for your peace and the ability to return to their fields. May we see the swords turn to plowshares and the fair and equitable access to land and its provisions for each of us. Loving God, we ask for your forgiveness for the times where we have taken your provision for granted and have not acknowledged the grace shown in our circumstances or the efforts of others to make our lives possible. Grant that we will be more attentive in the future and give due thanks to those who provide for us. Amen. And we join together in the words that Jesus provided. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today your daily bread. Forgive us our sons, sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, welcome everyone, those gathered here in the building or online, whether you're watching now live or watching the recordings later. You are most welcome to be with us and to be part of this community. Nigel, can I ask you to bring our notices? Good morning and welcome from me also. Uh, especially welcome to those of you online. We've had a, a difficult week with the internet here. It's generally not 
been working. Uh, we're working this morning by dint of being tethered onto a mobile phone, which is running, a, running everything. If you understand what that means, you'll be impressed. If you don't understand, just be impressed and be grateful for it. Um, so it's all been very difficult. We're hoping that will get sorted soon. It's, it's a matter outside of the church's control, largely. What that does mean is that the AGM we have this afternoon, which is going ahead here at 1.30, Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that online because to get a signal in the basement is just beyond us. So if you're listening in and you were hoping to join us online, I'm very sorry you won't be able to today. But for the rest of you, please do join us at 1.30 for our AGM here in the basement. So we've got one or two other notices. You'll have seen this leaflet in your orders of service this morning for a meet the neighbours meeting here on the 1st of November. Now when we hear meet the neighbours we often think that's the churches together in Westminster thing uh, and, and it's not quite that, it's meet our church neighbours, meet the people who use and this building and who are part of the wider community of, of which we're a body. So please do put that in your diaries. And I think there's a bit of a sign-up sheet in the reception so that you can just let people know you're coming. It'll be helpful. There's going to be refreshments provided. So it's helpful to know roughly how many people are coming. If you've got questions about that, Judith is the one to ask sitting here in the front row. And please do come along to that if you're able on Friday the 1st of November, which is in about three weeks' time. Um, we do have our church holiday weekend coming up on the 15th to 17th of November, which um, is nearly full. So if you've booked for that, we will be chasing you to make sure you pay the remainder of your payment for that beforehand. So do bear that in mind. And if you don't know about that and you'd like to come, we have, uh, I think, one or maybe two rooms available available. Uh, both either for one person or for a couple. So if you're interested, please speak to Simon and find out more about that. That's uh, 15th to the 17th of November. Uh, next Sunday, here at 1.30, we're having uh, a training session in anti-Semitism and how to respond to anti-Semitism, how to recognize it and how to make sure our dialogues around various justice issues don't stray into anti-Semitism. That's next Sunday at 1.30, so do come along for that if you can. And now Simon's going to come and talk to us about something he's doing starting tonight. Thanks, Nigel. It's really good to be back to see your lovely faces. Uh, I, for those of you who don't know, if you're visiting today, I've been away uh, for the last three Sundays. Uh, Liz and I were celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary, and we went on a trip to China, uh, which was amazing. And I'll bore you with uh, photos if you want me to, but just to say it's nice to be back. Um, in terms of uh, what I'm doing tonight, uh, tonight I'm going to be leading an online book study group um, I've been asked to do this by the church, uh, our neighbours down the road at St. James's Piccadilly, down the other end of Shaftesbury Avenue. It's an existing book group that they have in place. And they asked me if I'd lead uh, three sessions. So the first one is tonight and the next two are a bit later in the month, all on Sunday evenings. And I I'm going to be leading, looking at a book by a chap called Walter Wink, which is a name to conjure with. Um, it's a, a fantastic book, looking at the way in which um, the, the structures and powers that exist in our society, in our institutions, so it's maybe in our churches or, or in our, our global financial institutions, w the way in which those structures interact at a spiritual level and what the place of Christian disciples is as we seek to discern and respond to the powers that exist in our world. If that is of interest to you, and I hope it is because it's it's really about how the church relates to the world and society and itself. You're really welcome to come. If you haven't bought and read the book yet, um, despite the fact that I know Libby's had it in the news sheet for the last few weeks, 
you can still come and tonight you'll you'll get an introduction into what Walter Wink's thinking is about and if that whets your appetite you can always buy the book it's only a tenner on and, and read it afterwards so open invitation um, the link to join is in the news email which I, I think all of the regular congregation get if you don't get the news email and you still want to join tonight come and grab me afterwards and I'll tell you how to find uh, to join online thanks very much Simon, that sounds interesting. It sounds like a book I need to read. <laughs> um, yes. Anyway, let's continue our service with a prayer of dedication for the giving and the works of the church. Loving God, it is from what you have provided that we give to this church and the works here. May you bless the giving may you inspire us to be generous and particularly this Sunday as we go to our AGM and elect the new deacons may you bless them with the wisdom and the stewardship for this violence Amen Roseanne would you bring us the reading please Good morning. Verses 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, they do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image off. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation. They rose early the next day and offered burnt up. People sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people, whom you put up out of the land, to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and have worshipped it, and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, and said, Your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand, why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them? from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants, give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster. Thank you, Rosanne. And we stand to sing. Creation sings God's loving song, calling the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day. We stand.
ask Simon to come and bring his sermon for us. And we just ask the blessing of God on the words that have been prepared and on our hearts and minds as we listen. Amen. Thanks, Matthew. We're continuing our journey this autumn through the Hebrew Bible, through the revelation of God to the people of Israel. So we're, we're still firmly in the book of Exodus at the moment, as we're, we're exploring how God relates to God's people of old, as we then journey eventually as we get towards Advent into the Jesus story. And I want us to pick up on a, a phrase from the first verse uh, of our reading today. Uh, which is, um, the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. The people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. This raised a big question for the Israelites in the wilderness, and I think it can raise a, a corresponding question for us. How are you to respond when the way in which you are used to meeting God suddenly is no longer available? See, for the Israelites, Moses was their spiritual rock. He was their leader. He was, really, their saviour. He is the one who had brought them out of enslavement. He brought them out from the land of Egypt. It was Moses who had defeated Pharaoh. Moses who had led them through the wilderness. Moses who had struck water from the rock at Horeb so the people didn't die of thirst. And now, all of a sudden, Moses wasn't there. He'd gone up the mountain, and he hadn't come back. He'd gone there to meet with God, to bring the next revelation, and the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. And the people in the valley below didn't know what to do next. The one who had been their priest and their prophet, the one who had represented God to them and them to God was no longer with them, so what are they to do? When I learned this story in Sunday school, because it is a great Sunday school story, I was told that the people manufactured an idol at this point, and that the golden calf that they made with their, you know, jewellery, their wives' earrings and so on, uh, that this golden calf was, I was told this was probably an image of Baal, the ancient Near Eastern fertility god. However, rereading it now, I'm not so sure that right. They definitely make a golden calf, they definitely worship it and, and offer sacrifices to it. But when Aaron presents this golden calf to the Israelites, he doesn't introduce it as Baal or some other ancient Near Eastern god. Rather, he introduces it as the one who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Interestingly, this is something they had previously ascribed to Moses. In verse 1, let's read it again. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And so we end up with this golden calf being the one who brought the mark out of the land of Egypt in place of Moses who's now gone up the mountain. And the problem here, I think, isn't so much that they go worshipping the false gods of the other nations. I'm not sure that's what they're doing. I think what they're doing is making a false image of their own god. The sin of Israel here isn't a departure from the worship of Yahweh, Rather, it's the manufacturing of a false representation of their God. And friends, this is a far more insidious sin. And it's one that creeps easily upon us all. Now, of course, none of us are immune from the sin of idolatry. Humans 
have a remarkable capacity to construct new gods after our own images and then devote sacrifice and worship to them. Of course we do. From the sacrifices of money we make to the gods of free market consumerism, to the worship we give to those images of our own identity that exist in our social media streams, from the sacrifices of time we offer to the gods of entertainment, to the worshipful pursuit of the gods of sex and pleasure, in so many ways we construct our other gods and at times we worship them with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. However, alluring though such idolatrous distractions may be, they're also fairly easy to identify. Far harder to pin down are those places where we don't so much make new gods for ourselves as when we construct false images of the God that we know and love and have been following. And we are particularly prone to such acts. When we, like the people of Israel in the wilderness, find ourselves cut adrift from our certainties. We are living through a time of societal change. Whatever it is that comes after post-modernity has not come yet. The change was there before the pandemic. It was well written about. The pandemic accelerated it globally. And we now live in a world where we are realizing that the things we used to find immovable and immutable are now fluid and transient. So some people mourn the passing of their personal certainties of gender identity and sexuality and they find a threat in the new world of grey areas and non-binaries and transgenders that is emerging. Some of us mourn the passing of the monolithic institutions of our society. The membership of everything from Rotary to the political party to your local church is plummeting. The monolithic institutions that gave us the narratives by which we could live are not as they once were. And in the collapse of these, what people call meta-narratives, these stories to live by, as those have gone from us, People are having to find a new way through an unknown wilderness. And the question here for us, perhaps, is how we can identify those times in our lives when our equivalent of Moses has gone up the mountain and has not come back down to us yet. What are the things, the people, that have consistently in our experience in the past made the invisible God seem real to us? but which are no longer there in the same way anymore. It might be a friend, a mentor, maybe a minister. You know, the, the minister who baptized me made God so real to me. He's now gone. Where do I go for that? Where do you go to meet God when the certainties that once held you and sustained you have gone from you? It might be a style of worship that barely exists anymore. Do you remember the packed congregation of your childhood singing the hymns and songs of the great faith of old? And now we have a minister who chooses new verses for traditional hymn tunes and makes us sing things on the guitar. And Oh gosh, it's fine, but it's not what it was. It might be a form of prayer that once seemed so meaningful, but which has run dry in recent years. What are you missing? What are you, what are you longing for? What is your Moses that has gone from you and has not come back? And here's the difficult question. What have you replaced him with? What have you replaced it with? I'll leave that one for us to ponder. Let's head back to the Bible for a minute. The story of the Israelites in the wilderness is part of the Jewish prehistory mythology. 
It's one of those stories that evolved and was passed down from generation to generation through the oral traditions until eventually it gets written down around about the 6th century BC, written down by the Jews in exile in Babylon. And this means in order to read it well, we need to have an eye on those who actually wrote it. Because, of course, you know, it is written many centuries after the time it is set. And we need to know who wrote it and why they wrote it in order to understand why they wrote what they did. When we know why they shaped it the way they did, and if we can understand who its first readers were, then we will ourselves understand it better. So, this text about Moses going up the mountain and not coming back needs to be heard in the context of the Babylonian exile. And for the exiles, their answer to the question of what was it that had gone from them would have been the temple in Jerusalem. You see, in 587 BC, the Babylonians invaded and they despoiled the temple and they desecrated the Holy of Holies and despite what some Indiana Jones fans might like to believe, sadly they destroyed the Ark of the Covenant at that moment containing the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments inscribed on them. Everything that had given the Jewish people of this period stability in their religious life had gone from them. The temple was destroyed. The Ark of the Covenant was destroyed. The tablets with the Ten Commandments on were smashed. Well, surrounded by the images of the Babylonian gods, which they knew to be false, no temptation to worship them. But nonetheless, they were left wondering what their god -like looked like for them in exile. When everything they had thought they knew about God had gone, all their certainties had been swept away by the societal change of invasion and people displacement. And here, I think, we find the answer to one of the more puzzling aspects of our reading this morning. Did you notice that there's only one golden calf, but the people refer to it in the plural? Let's listen to it again, verse 4. Aaron took the gold from them and formed it in a mold and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What is going on here? I love this kind of little puzzle. I think the answer can be found in the book of 1 Kings, which tells the story of the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel to the Assyrian invaders in 722 BC, about 130 years before the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem. So, if you know your Israelite history, by that time, Israel had divided into two kingdoms, a northern kingdom ruled by a king called Jeroboam, and a southern kingdom based in Jerusalem ruled by Rehoboam of the house of David. Jeroboam's problem was that Rehoboam had possession of the temple. So the people from the northern kingdom kept making pilgrimages south to offer sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, it would be a bit like trying to run the United Kingdom and requiring everybody from Scotland to keep coming to London to get all their laws passed. Hang on a minute. Anyway, that's quite a good analogy. And they wanted to break away. They wanted an independence referendum, in other words. Well, his worry, you see, was that eventually the northern kingdom might reject him as king and turn its allegiance to Rehoboam of Jerusalem. And actually, there'd be more unity. He was worried that there might be unity in Israel because he'd lose his northern power. So, listen to this from 1 Kings chapter 12, 26 to 30. Then Jeroboam said to himself, Now, the kingdom may well revert to the house of David in the south in Jerusalem, if this people continues to go to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. The heart of this people will turn against their master, King Rehoboam of Judah, and they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam of Judah. So, the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, you've been going to Jerusalem long enough. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and he put the other in Dan. And this thing is, this became a sin. For the people went to worship the one at Bethel and before, it, and before the other one as far as Dan. So, did you spot it? The story of Moses, Aaron and the golden calf, written in exile in Babylon in the 6th century, 
is directly quoting from the book of 1 Kings, which describes the sin that brought down the northern kingdom over a century earlier. Jeroboam's two golden calves, who are proclaimed as the gods who brought Israel up out the land of Egypt, as a direct challenge to the temple in Jerusalem, they become the golden calf in the book of Exodus. Scholars tell us that what's probably going on here is that the calves were intended as earthly pedestals for the heavenly Yahweh to stand on. You can imagine a kind of uh, great statue of, of God standing with a kind of a foot on either calf, riding them as a great kind of symbol of power. And that they functioned in a similar manner, maybe to the Ark of the Covenant did in the temple as the place of earthly worship of the invisible God. The thing is, these golden calves, whether they're the ones from the northern kingdom or whether they're the ones that are referenced in the Babylonian story, they aren't idolatrous Baal gods. What they are are false representations of the true God brought into being as Jeroboam tries to break the Jerusalem temple's monopoly on Yahweh worship. And so when in exile in Babylon, the Jerusalemites reflected on this story to help them understand their own experience of losing the temple, they used this story to frame their retelling of the story of Moses, Aaron and the people in the wilderness. The experience of Israel's wanderings in the wilderness becomes a key metaphor for them understanding their own Babylonian exile. And the story of the golden calf functions within that as a warning of the temptation to make false images of God and as a call to faithfulness even when God seems impossibly distant. So, how do we hear this in our time of exile? As the world changes around us, and we find ourselves cast off from the moorings that used to hold us. As people pass from us, who were once so important to us. As institutions fade that once gave us certainty but no longer function in the same way. As we have to find new paths in the wilderness of our world. Where, I wonder, will we turn for sustenance and stability? And how will we hear this story of Moses, Aaron, and the golden calf? What temptations have we faced to construct not false gods? I mean, we do, as I said, but that's not really my concern this morning. My concern this morning is what temptations have we faced to construct false images of the true God? What have we tried to put in place of that which was taken from us. I'm not offering lots of answers here. I'm really just asking questions, but I do have some wonderings that might spark your own thinking and reflection. I wonder if sometimes we make golden calves from our memories, worshipping that which used to be and devoting ourselves to the task of bringing it back into being when it's just gone. I also wonder if we might ponder the experience of the early Christians in the time after Jesus was taken from them. See, their experience was a bit like this. Their prophet and priest had gone from their sight. They no longer had direct access to the one who had represented God to them and them to God. Once Jesus had ascended into heaven, the early Christians had to work out how to relate to God without Jesus as their intermediary, there to do it for them and with them. God may have been fully present and revealed in Jesus, but once Jesus was no longer with them in person, what were they to do? You can see, can't you, how this, this questioning echoes down through the story of God's revelation. And the answer, of course, for them, as it was for the Babylonians, in, uh, the, the Israelites in exile in Babylon, as it was, as it is for us, the answer is, well, you have to discover that God is still with you, but in a new way. Not in the worship of the rebuilt temple, nor in the person of Jesus, 
nor even just in the remembrance of Jesus' words and commands, but by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus is God's gift to you and to me and to us. God is not, in the end, known to us in our memories, nor in our place or style of worship, nor even in our holy texts. God is known to us by the Holy Spirit, at work in our hearts, drawing us to full worship to the true God, and always challenging us, challenging all our attempts and temptations to make false representations of the true God. Let us be attentive to the words of the Spirit. Let us be submissive to one another and to the mind of Christ. And then maybe, maybe the Spirit will cause the people to live again in new ways. Amen. Thank you, Simon. Let us take a moment to reflect and to think and to prepare as we come to communion. For those of you who are joining us online, please take the opportunity of the next hymn if you wish to join us in bread and wine, in making sure you have them available and to hand. But for those of us here in the building, let us stand as we are able to sing together, my song is love unknown, my saviour's love to me.
Please be seated. The prophet Isaiah writes, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all... He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So come to this table, friends, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. In his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul tells us of the institution of this meal, saying, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let us pray. creative, loving, redeeming, and restoring God. We thank you for this bread and this wine. The bread which is the produce of fields, grain that has grown and been harvested and turned into sustenance for our lives. Grapes which have ripened in the sun and are now wine for us to drink in joy and sorrow. We thank you that we are so intricately interconnected with the life of this planet, that our stories are intertwined with your story and the story of every other human being and the story of nature itself. And we thank you that through your death and resurrection, you redeem all that has been created, that you redeem us, that you redeem our planet. And we long for the consummation of that redemption in our own lives and in our world. Amen. So here at Bloomsbury, as we break bread and drink wine together, everyone is invited to share with us in this food that comes as a gift from God. If, however, you would rather not take communion this morning, that's fine. Please just let it pass you by as it's served. And our practice here is to eat the bread as soon as it has been served, as a sign of our personal salvation, uh, and then to retain the cup of wine once that's served, and we all drink together as a sign of our community in Christ. So friends, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, it is for you.
take this bread in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The wine that we share is the wine of the kingdom of God. It is the sign of God's undertaking for the life of the world. Let all who seek Christ take and drink.
black head. Jesus said, this wine is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. So drink this and remember that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Now we're going to be led in our prayers for the world. Let's all join together in prayer. Let's all pray. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord. Oh, thank the Lord for all his love. Lord God, we thank you that you are indeed the God of harvest. That all good things come from you. You created this world and it is a good world. And we thank you that even in these days where we see climate change, where we see wars, where we see difficult situations the world over, yet still there is enough. Still there is enough food. Still there is enough water. Still there is enough land for all to live on. We pray our God that we do not take these things for granted. Though in London we might feel far from ploughing the fields, yet we acknowledge our dependence on those who do. We thank you for those the world over who grow crops, who tend animals. We thank you for those who bring that food to us, even for the lorries driving to supermarkets that we may purchase it. And we thank you for those that sell the food to us. We remember how in the days of the pandemic, we all began to realise something of how dependent we are on such people and ultimately how dependent we are upon you. We pray that in our greed, we might not store more than we need, that we might not support systems that keep money from those who do the growing that keep land from those who have no land, that take away water from places that need it. As we look around the world, we see much injustice. We see wars so often around matters of land, of water, of food and supplies. And we pray for peace. We pray that you will confound those who seek to bring war and violence to others. We pray that you will give courage and boldness to those in power, that they might seek peace, that they might be prepared to change the status quo so that all may peacefully live, so that all may benefit from the harvest you give. We pray this morning for the lands of Israel and Lebanon, for the land of Sudan, for the land of Ukraine, Myanmar, Yemen, and so many other places where there is strife. Give peace, we pray. Lord God, we thank you for what we have. Sometimes we are ungrateful. Even those of us in this country that have the least have so much more than so many around the world. We pray that we might recognise that all we have comes from you, that we might hold our goods lightly, that we might always be ready to share what we have, to use it for good, 
that we will seek to use our gold to do good for others, not merely to sit in our own stores, nor to make our own modern day calves. We do pray for this our nation. So often we watch the news and it seems to be bad news. It seems to be news of trouble, of injustice, of complaint, of strife. We pray for peace in our society. We pray that the voices that speak truth might be amplified. That those that speak lies, that those that seek, seek to might be quietened. We pray that we ourselves might be a people of peace. A people speaking peace to those around us, to society at Hello. large, but even to those Tim, you brought, you who we the come into colors. contact day by day. <laughs> we are a people Hi, nice of to meet hope. You. Nice we are a people so that have heard of the God of love. No, no, I was going to go for the other cheek. You didn't come out for the other cheek. That was the issue. And all we say, <laughs> and all that we are in our daily lives. And Lord God, as we think about the great harvest, the, the provision of food and sustenance, we remember the Bible speaks of another harvest. Like the prophet Isaiah was told, the harvest fields are ready. Who shall I send? And we pray that, like him, we might respond, Here am I. Send me. Help each one of us to be part of that harvest. Part of a harvest for the kingdom of God. A harvest proclaiming the love of God. A harvest working for good that all may know that we have a God of hope, a God of love, a God of justice. So our God, this harvest, we thank you. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that the harvest does not totally fail. We pray that we may remember your faithfulness to us. That we might not say, where is the God who brought Israel out of Egypt? But that we might know you close by. We pray that in our thoughts and dreams and fears, we might know you close by. Be with us all evermore, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Nigel. And so as we come to our final hymn, may I extend in particular to the visitors, but to all, the invitation to stay for tea and coffee after the service, that opportunity to talk, to know a bit more about each other, and to hear our responses to some of what's happened today or the past week. So as you are able, let us stand to sing Come, you thankful people, come. Raise the song of Harvest Hope.
ponder those images of God in our minds to determine if they are true or false. May the God who gives us peace make us holy in every way and keep our whole being, spirit, soul and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ.